you know, I walk out so many times and I know the place by heart. I've been there so many times. You know where you're going. You know where you. You know where there's that stick. You don't want to trip over. You know where all these things are. There's really nothing quite like anywhere else in the state, and it's the largest inland wetland in the United States. It's so big. I. It's it's amazing. It's. You'd think after twenty some odd years, you'd be used to it, but the size of this place is just—it's it, overwhelming. Um, and with that size comes diversity, and, and the variety of wildlife here is just unbelievable. I was born and raised in Boisington, which is uh, seven to eight miles north of here. Uh, my dad loved to come out here. He spent hours fishing out here, and so I would get. To, we were out here all the time fishing, and I just couldn't believe the birds. I mean, there was just, it was just unbelievable for birds and wildlife out here. And I just got hooked on the place. Kansas has had um, about, I think historically, about 2% of the area has been covered by wetlands in the past. And that's, that number is down by half um, these days. I mean, there's, there's only about 1% of Kansas' area that actually has wetlands. And so it is a unique habitat, even historically. You go back to uh, the Spanish and Coronado, it's interesting how the, the different attitudes of, say, the Spanish, uh, Coronado and his men came up to that area, made mention of Cheyenne Bottoms in their, in their notes and uh, in their journals. Uh, they saw it as a very rich country with a lot of potential, whereas, uh, you know, uh, Pike, Zebulon Pike's expedition in 1806-1807, uh, they saw it more like a desert out there. It just depends on your perspective. You know, the Spanish saw it more coming up from the southwest, saw it more as a, a pretty lush land where Easterners from the forest, you know, there's no trees, so it must not be any good. Garden City was thought to, it was going to be the new Chicago. And uh, so all this irrigation, and this begins to struggle between uh, Kansas and Colorado over Arkansas River water. The attempts to make Cheyenne Bottoms a reservoir comes from uh, earlier irrigation projects upstream in uh, at Garden City. And they had great plans for the Great Lake Cheyenne. Uh, there was a, a journal out of Denver called Irrigation Age that uh, did a cover story on the Great Lake Cheyenne that was coming soon, complete with uh, a steamboat, a riverboat where there would be a thousand people aboard playing cards and having a good time and, and hotels lining the banks and, and uh, all these grand designs um, which once the canal was completed, in fact they even leveled part of the uh, land next to the canal uh, for a railroad um, to take the tourists uh, to, the, to the lake. Um, but. There was never more than two or three feet of water in the lake even after the, the canal was completed and, and so it was a bust. Uh, we get into the era of conservation and Teddy Roosevelt, president in the early 20th century, and there were a lot of followers of Teddy Roosevelt in Kansas and places like Iowa, uh, a progressive Republican who uh, was a strong believer in taking care of your resources and making sure you always had them and uh, so we started to get laws about bag limits um, and eventually even the game warden. I think by 1916 we had bag limits but no way to enforce them and then a game warden was, the, uh, the position was created. In August of 1927 there was a cloud burst uh, upstream from Cheyenne Bottoms. Uh, 14 inches of rain fell in a fairly short amount of time and filled the thing up. Uh, more than pretty much anyone had ever seen. It was a, a lake some uh, seven miles long, and uh, the uh, the game warden at that time was a guy named Bert Doe's, <clears throat> and he, he made note that the size of Cheyenne Bottoms was exactly the same as the Sea of Galilee. So he took that rhetoric and, and, uh, and made a lot of hay with it that, uh, um, selling Cheyenne Bottom to the new Sea of Galilee that must be preserved and, and maybe we can get some federal money 
to uh, renew this idea of canals from the Arkansas River, but as a game preserve, not as a casino resort. We should bring in, at this point, Frank Robel to the story, who was a, a volunteer um, uh, who, who liked to tag um, ducks and these, <clears throat> these ducks would be found in, in places. They didn't really understand the Central Flyway yet. And so these ducks would be tagged, they would be found in Canada, they would be found in South America, Central America, Mexico. And that's where people began to realize the significance of Cheyenne Bottoms. Management goal, in, in, when it was first established even to today, is in an effort to try and emulate the natural process. Prior to any development, the basin would go dry two out of every five or six years. And drying of a wetland is, is part of the cycle. That's, it, it needs it, and uh, without it, it does, doesn't function as well. And then when the 50s came around and they started to construct those dikes, dividing it up into pools, uh, uh, putting in all the water control structures, the inlet system to bring in the supplemental water, the principal goal was to provide annual waterfowl hunting opportunity because the the money for this all came from either the federal aid program which is hunter dollars or hunting license fees and so that was a principal emphasis the idea was there's this big center pool and then the peripheral pools and the idea was to be able to move water around um, and because eventually the water just wasn't there anymore um, they lost that capability. And I think that was the thing that everyone really paid attention to is that it was no longer functioning the way it was meant to function. The heart of the conflict in Kansas probably for the last 40 or 50 years has been between irrigators uh, in Southwest Kansas and uh, Cheyenne Bottoms preservations. Initially, it was environmental groups, the Kansas Audubon Council, the Wildlife Federation, KNRC, um, Kansas Ornithological Society, the Wildlife Society, Fisheries Group, and all, you know, it just kind of snowballed once people found out about it and realized that by working together, they had much more leverage. All our water rights are for surface water. We don't have any, we don't pump groundwater. And when you start looking at the, the number of water right appropriations through time that the state has handed out, they really started to increase dramatically in the 60s and 70s when center pivot irrigation really started to come into its own. With that spread of, of center pivot irrigation, uh, the groundwater is being lowered. And as a result, the base flows of perennial streams is gone because you've lowered the water table below the stream bed and, and it just dries up. And that's what's happened in the arc. If you go down there now, it's dry. Uh, wet walnut, it only had water after significant rain events because the base flows were gone. And we started being, our agency started being pressured um, in a friendly soda way to uh, use Kansas water law to, to get our water right. And Kansas water law is first in time, first in right. Western water law is another name for it. Um, water is appropriated by your uh, appropriation number and they're handed out sequentially one two three four five and in the wet walnut basin we have a water right it's number 400 and I can't remember 400 and something and nowadays they're up into the 40,000 so ours is a really senior water right in the wet walnut and we filed an impairment with the Division of Water Resources and said these groundwater pumping has ruined the, or killed the, the base flow in the wet walnut, which is impairing our water right. We can't get our water right. And that led to a fight that probably still has ramifications in terms of people, some people's attitudes. The wet walnut creek Iguka constrains some irrigators, but not all. 
And to understand that, it's helpful to appreciate the different types of water rights that are established in Kansas. Some water rights are very old. They're called vested rights. They actually preceded the 1946 Appropriations Act, which established the system that we now enjoy in Kansas about people applying and receiving water rights. Prior to 1946, people established their water rights by simply securing land, securing use of the water. So vested water rights are so old that they were not touched at all by the wet walnut Iguka restrictions. Chief Engineer came out and said after many, many hearings in Great Bend where people literally circled their wagons and, and were fighting for their, their livelihood, their water. Um, and and they, they tried to paint it as ducks versus agriculture. And we looked at it more as we're trying to salvage a system here. And left unchecked, communities are going to start drying up because you, a community won't be able to pump enough water for their citizens in a town or whatever. And um, dry land farmers, I've heard stories where they had to re-drill their domestic wells just for their house because the water table was lowered so much. Junior water right holders were constrained substantially more than senior water right holders. So vested water right holders not constrained at all, senior water right holders constrained somewhat, junior water right holders constrained substantially. The other types of water right holders would apply to surface water rights, and those were not constrained at all either, similar to the vested groundwater rights. So you have some water right holders constrained substantially, some not at all. The farmer out west, he, uh, he would come to these meetings and he was one of those that was ducks against agriculture attitude. And he got hit pretty hard. He had a lot of junior water rights that were cut back to five inches. And as time went on, we kept going to these meetings. I couldn't believe it. One day he stood up and he said, this is called an IGUCA. That's an acronym for Intensive Groundwater Use Control Area in the Wet Walnut. He said, that IGUCA was the best thing that happened to me. He said, now I am a businessman. I'm no longer a farmer it made me sit down and have to start thinking about what I was doing. And he says, I'm making more money now than I was before. So what we'd studied was how much were they authorized to use and how much did they actually use? Made the comparison. So over the two five-year allotments that we've analyzed so far based on the data that is publicly available, we concluded that most farmers don't use their water, not nearly as much. 44% of the farmers use 50% or less of their authorized allotment. 15% of them use less than 10% of their allotment. It's the same situation that we saw on the wet walnut. And Cheyenne Bottoms has that senior water right. It's so theoretically almost 50% of their surface water rights coming off the ark, and they're not being delivered. Why? Because there's no water to deliver. Why? because there's a lot of irrigation going on. It would be really interesting to see if um, the coalition could reassemble itself, so to speak. I suspect it would take another lawsuit against the Wildlife and Parks Department um, because clearly they have a senior water right. But agriculture's pretty much reign supreme in Kansas. But the bulk of the farmers are using only a fraction of the water they're allotted. That would indicate to me that the IGUCA constraints are not very binding. Embedded within that, one has to take note, they are allowed to carry over their water indefinitely from a one five-year period to the next five-year period. So the difference between what they're authorized and what they actually use could be their attempt to carry over the water into the next five year period as some insurance policy, some anticipation that uh, weather conditions are gonna get hotter and drier, which is consistent with climate change projections. So it makes sense. But the fact that they're even in a position to do that is an indication that these constraints are not strongly binding. Water management is always gonna be a, a challenge. Um, when this place was first developed, that Arc River flowed year-round, wet walnut flowed year-round, and, and that supplemental water was available whenever you wanted. Uh, the managers at that time, I've talked to them, 
uh, after a heavy rain when the river was real muddy and, and silt laden because of the runoff, they'd shut the inlet system down because they didn't want that dirty water in here. And then when it cleared up, then they'd start bringing water in. Uh, now, if there's water, we're bringing it in. The reason why birds stop here is because of the food source that the, the wetlands provide them. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that there's a base, you know, kind of the base of the food chain here are the aquatic invertebrates. That is such an important component to Cheyenne Bottoms. Um, if we don't have water, we're not going to have aquatic invertebrates. And because of that, we're not going to get birds stopping here. If you've got a, tr a forested part of your land, it's considered wasteland for tax purposes. Unless it's actively, you know, actively agriculture or actively developed or it's residential, it's considered wasteland. And that truly, truly amazed me. Um, especially as a birder, who I love to go out in the springtime, this time of the year, and watch the warblers and all the other things that are coming through in the spring. And I'm thinking, but you know, the powers that be consider this wasted land because it's not being farmed. And I think in many ways that was kind of the attitude toward Cheyenne Bottoms by a lot of the folks is that, oh, it's just birds and, you know, who cares? And I don't think that they really understand how much birders spend every year. Um, it's literally billions of dollars. And for whatever reason, Kansas hasn't bought into that psychologically. We have not tapped our special places. Um, and it, it's sad. I think it's truly sad that it almost buys into this notion of you drive through Kansas at night because there's nothing worth seeing. And, and I get as... Even though we've only been here 30 years, we're not natives. But it makes me really angry when I hear that because I think Kansas is a beautiful state. Um, the, the Flint Hills, the bottoms, the, it's just gorgeous. And I don't understand that mindset, I guess. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me. We're spoiled. You have this in your backyard, you know, you got fishing in the summer and hunting in the fall, you're here a lot. We're, we get spoiled. And the people the people that come here, they they like, you're so lucky you live here and you got all this right here in your backyard. The first five minutes of getting the kids in the water is total chaos. We get all the oohs and, and you know, the screams and that sort of thing. But the most interesting thing about this job is to, to literally see the light bulb go on. The first time that they, they actually catch some sort of aquatic invert that's very interesting looking and that they had no idea was in the water. It's just nice to be able to keep it going on with the youth and the young people.